Uh, Primoz looked really banged up, uh, seems to be okay. I mean, he's hurt, but he will, in, in two, three weeks, he will be recovered from this completely. And then Jay Vine, that's, that's not good. That's definitely not good. I mean, good news is that he doesn't need surgery, but it's going to take a while before he gets back. The good thing is, the good news is that everybody will get back to normal. Welcome to the Move Podcast. I'm JB Hager, and I am joined by Johan Bruniel, who's got so much going on right now, you're not going to believe it, <laughs> and uh, Spencer Martin. And we're going to talk about uh, the 2024 Itzulia, the uh, Basque Country Tour, which is what this has historically been called, correct? This is the one we've always known as the Tour of the Basque Country. Uh, but the what's unfortunate for each stage winner and then our overall winner is that this year's race completely overshadowed. The big story is the crash that took out some of the best contenders for this year's Tour de France. And that is the big lead story. And we're going to start with that. In fact, with uh, let's start with uh, Spencer. Why don't you give us the medical update of who's out and what the what we know about their injuries so far? Well, so there's like 13 riders that were injured in the crash. We'll just go with the ones that pertain to the the tour, just for brevity's sake. Um, Jonas Vindigo would be the is like the big headline. He crashed hard. If you watched the the race, you saw he looked very in a lot of difficulty. They were carting him off with oxygen. Immediately, you know something's not right when you see that. The team comes out and says he has a broken collarbone. We're like, well, yeah, but maybe there's something else. And then later it comes out that he has a, I believe it's a perforated or punctured lung, which is not good um, at all. So he's out in, indefinitely. I, I don't, Johan, maybe you have more detail on coming back from that. I have no experience with that. I don't know anyone who has come back from that. So I don't have a timeline. Pretty much Roglic went down. Um, he had crashed the day before as well, but he actually, didn't appear to break anything. It looked bad at first. He was kind of laying in that uh, cement culvert, but he seemed to just have superficial injuries. He's probably the best off of the big contenders. And then Remco Evenepoel went off the road, missed the cement ditch that engulfed a lot of the riders, almost went into a tree, fell off right in time, broke his collarbone and shoulder blade, which isn't good. I don't think any of us would want to do that today. We'd, we'd be pretty bummed about that. But as in terms of cycling injuries, you can have a pretty quick recovery from that. So I'm sure Rimco will take that and run with it because he can, you know, he's probably already had surgery and on the road to recovery, probably on the trainer this weekend. Johan and, and then Jay Vine, not a GC contender himself. It probably maybe at this race he would have been, but he's a key, key domestique for Visma, or they were probably planning on that. He had multiple verte vertebrae broken. Looks like he's in, you know, tough like tough condition, no, no surgery though. They said today. So I guess that's positive, but good. he that's will be good. off the bike for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you, 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 you said it, uh, um, Jonas Vingegaard was, you know, collarbone, uh, broken ribs also, I think. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the well. least of the worries. I mean, normally if you, if you have a broken collarbone, you can have surgery, you can be on the home trainer, uh, in a week and on the road in two weeks and meanwhile the ribs will bother you but they will heal now the 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 perfect it's a collapsed lung collapsed lung is obviously something that um will take some time to heal i i don't think that his start participation at the tour de france is for the moment at risk i think he'll be ready i mean i think he'll be at the start of the tour now of course this is far from ideal towards preparing for the tour because even if within a week or two weeks he can start riding his bike a little bit he can't start training quality training that's just out of the question so um that's obviously going to be uh, a big a big issue you know compare it a little bit with um let's say the tour of the Basque country finishes uh a week later you have this the the Ardennes classics Exactly. A little bit what happened to Pogacar last year, right? So he yeah, yeah. broke his elbow uh, in um, in Liège Baston Liège, and he got ready for the tour. But the way he had to get ready was kind of an accelerated way, which then obviously compromises your 
you know, your endurance and your, your base, base, base form. So, um, listen, at the end of the day, I think the way this crash happened, the way it looked, the speeds they were going at, I've seen reports that Remco was, is, is, uh, device was saying 81 kilometers per hour the moment he crashed uh and, and you know initially it looked like he was gonna avoid big damage he could have hit that tree that would have been a different story it was a, it would have been really bad ramco uh broken collarbone broken scapula i, I think it's as good as it can get <laughs> considering the way it could yeah. have been uh primos looked really banged up uh seems to be okay i mean he's hurt but he will in in two three weeks he will be recovered from this completely and then jay fine that's that's not good that's definitely not good i mean good news is that he doesn't need surgery but it's going to take a while before he gets back the good thing is the good news is that everybody will get back to normal which i think considering the circumstances we should all say okay this could have been so much worse. You say back to normal. I'm thinking about the, the, the mental part of it. You know, there were always question marks with Remco after he went over that wall uh, a few years ago. And then Jonas, I'm thinking in particular of Jonas, will, will he be rattled mentally uh, to be the type of contender he has been? We shall see. Yeah, well, you know, crashes, obviously, you, you know, it happens in cycling. You have to deal with it physically and mentally. And so <clears throat> I think personally they're, you know, you're going to be okay. I think the question we have to ask ourselves, why do these crashes, it seems that they happen more and more and often and, and not just, and, and with, with any type of rider. So what do you th- What do you think Spencer? What's happening? Well, yeah, it's probably a lot of things. First of all, that corner, they probably could have padded that. I know that sounds ridiculous because you like, can't go out and pad every corner on the course. You could probably look at that and think, well, they're coming through here at 50 miles an hour. Maybe we throw some pads up on this, on these boulders and concrete. That would have helped. My big question is, Johan, why, why are they going? So they're going 50 miles an hour. All the contenders are fighting to be at the front into a sharp corner, almost 90 degrees. Imagine that, guys. Like, let's go out today and go 50 miles an hour and then try to turn our bikes. That's not easy. On pavement, it's not a highway. You know, there's roots under there. You could see them bumping up and down. They're all fighting to be at the front. That's why all these big names crashed, because they were all in the exact same spot at the front of the race. 40K from the finish at the Tour yeah. of the Basque Country. And you ask yourself, why? Why are they taking that risk to be there? Is is it like this obsession with like be at the front? Be at, it's I call it like be at the front culture. It's been going on for ten years with the GC contenders. Mathematics tells us not everyone can be at the front. There's limited space at the front. It's making I think it's making these races more and more and more dangerous. And they probably have the directors in their ear just all the time. Get to the front. Get to the front. Get the front. And yeah, no one is like, hey, with forty k from the finish at a race, it doesn't really matter. Like that's what I can't quite wrap my head around. They're all used to this. They're, I mean, they, they, they all know that you know, normally any cyclist knows that when there's a climb, you try to be at the front for the downhill, right? But once you're, you, once you're in the downhill, then you say, okay, now I'm in a good position. I'm going to, but they're it. four, four wide on that descent. That's you know, the thing. That's, that's the, crazy. That's the thing. So I spoke to a director who's at the Basque country, right? Uh, and I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he says, man, it's crazy. It's like every single descent, you have four teams going to the front. They all want to be in the front and they just keep going, you know? And, uh, I, I that's kind of, uh, kind of an, a, a certain behavior within the Peloton. Personally, I, I also think that there's other things to be considered. Um, the state of the road, first of all, was very tricky. You know, it was a, apparently it was a road that there's a lot of roots of trees that keep going there and pushing the asphalt a little bit up. So it was, it was bumpy and you don't necessarily see that now. Uh, it's, you know, it, you know, you can't, you can't just, I mean, it can happen in any corner, basically, especially, you know, you can't fence, you know, fence the whole course or, or put, you know, like padding, in every corner. Um, I, I have questions, Spencer, about the equipment. Um, bikes are getting faster and faster. We all know that frames are stiff, super stiff. Uh, 
high rims they you know they high profile rims they they're riding with them all the time now okay fine um disc brakes i although i think in the big picture disc brakes do obviously break a lot better than than the brakes from earlier on uh, so i'm not questioning that but i personally think that the the braking behavior has changed within the peloton that you have a disc brake you know it's going to stop you break later. Yeah. You don't anticipate anymore. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to, you know, it's going to slow you down. And so if you, if you can do that on your own, that's fine. But if that happens within a group, I just see lots and lots and lots of crashes where basically they're, they're, they're breaking and their front wheel goes, you know, out. And, and I, I mean, listen, if you go at 80 kilometers an hour and you break, it's, it's difficult to control your bike. Right. Uh, but above all, what I, I mean, and I don't want to sound like a cranky old guy, which sometimes I am, but I have serious doubts and questions about the, the width of the handlebars. We've talked about that already before. Yeah. I, I, I keep seeing it, you know, riders standard right now, it's 38 handlebars. Uh, you know, they're, obviously they're used to it, but nobody can tell me that if you have a larger base that you're not more stable obviously if you're if you're narrow you're more aero but it's difficult more difficult to handle and then on top of that what i also see is that with that kind of narrow handlebars and the slightly tilted in uh, brake levers it's now regulated to 10 degrees fine that's good but i don't see and i'm not saying that this is because this is why the crash happened right because i think I think Remco was the guy who kind of I mean, didn't go down first, but he he was the guy who was kind of missing the turn. But everybody behind, I don't see many riders anymore going down in the drops. They're always on the hoods. And and if you're on the hoods and you hit a hole, you're gone. You have nothing to, you know, grab anymore. When you're on the drops, it's different, right? And so I think that. Lots of riders now, because of the way the bikes are built, and the way handlebars are narrow, and you're looking for this arrow position, they gotten so used and and acclimat- like like used to this this arrow position on the brake on the brake levers. You know, like if you look at Mathieu van der Poel in the Tour of Flanders, for example, I've seen him like probably one minute out of everything. On the drops, he was always running on the hoods, which is now, you know, and when you train for this, it is the best aerodynamic position, but it's not the most stable one. And so I, I think that could be an issue, you know, that, that we have this whole generation of young riders now who have, you know, gotten used to this, this riding arrow, but it is less stable. I'll add to yeah. the uh, to the increase in accidents and get your thoughts on it, both of you, is the pressure to win on some of these other races that in the past, they might not have been so much pressure. You wouldn't have been racing downhill at the, these speeds into a sharp corner like Spencer mentioned. But in general, the pressure to win for, mm-hmm. for teams and get results around the, I mean, around the calendar year round Mm -hmm. is much higher than it used to be where it might've been. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do the best country. And then in the Giro we race, right? Yeah. Is some of that though, but just to sum up with Johan said, I think that's exactly right. So the, the crux of the issue is bikes are getting faster, but at the same time, harder to control. That's yeah. not good. That's not a good combination, but JB is some of that just self-inflicted pressure. Like I understand um, you know, uh, Deca- like the, the teams that actually had good races, like Decathlon, FDG, um, Israel wasn't here, but they've been doing really well so far early this season. They need to do well. They need those points. But, you know, does Remco need to win this? I, I just wonder if some of that pressure, and it's fun, it's fun that they can test it. But some of the pressure to me, like I have to win every race all the time. I think that's self-inflicted. Like, Johan, when you were, when you had Lance at Cir- Circle de Sarth, were you saying like you got to be at the front or was he just kind of on his own program till the tour and that made well, it safer? It's different. It's different. It's different. I think, I think things, anyway, the Basque, tour of the Basque country, Itzulia, as we call it, 
uh, or as it's called nowadays, it is a very important race. It's a super high level race. It's one of the seven prestigious races, uh, a part of the, the, the three grand tour. So, you know, I mean, when you can win that, that's like something really important on your resume. Uh, so I can understand that that's, you know, that there's pressure and that there's, there's people who are super motivated to do that. And, and everybody knows that the course in the Basque country is, you know, that you have to be in the front there. There are a lot of, a lot of up and downs, a lot of narrow roads. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the reason. I mean, it, it could also be a, a, a coincidence, you know, that certain, all of a sudden certain, certain crashes happen, but uh, I think you're right, Spencer, that it's nowadays when they're racing, they're always racing full on. There's, there are no more, there are no more easy parts in a stage and there are no more easy races where you can go to and take them like as, as, as a preparation race for another race. You, when you're racing, you're they racing full on all, every single race, important races, non-important races. It's always full gas. So does this again, here we are, how far into this 15 minutes into it and where you haven't even talked much about this actual race, does these, these, these injuries, does this pave the way for, for Pogacar in July? Roglic, Roglic, we don't know for certain and he's looking good, but what do you think? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the wheel turns, you know, I mean, it's, it's last year it was Pogacar. Now it's, it's Remco and, and, and Jonas, um, Primos went down twice really bad also. So, um, it's, it, it all, it all adds up to, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the Giro. I mean, yeah, you're always, you're always at risk whenever you do a race, uh, you know, you can crash anytime now. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of guys, a lot of really good guys together. I mean, even when you forget about Walt Van Aert and, and Jasper Stuyven and Mats Peterson in Belgium who, who had a bad crash too. So, um, I, I wouldn't say it paves the way, um, I, you know, it, the question, the question could be asked, you know, if this is now the situation, uh, and you're in the shoes of UAE and, and Bogacar, do you want to change your focus? And do you want to mm -hmm. say, okay, this is now the moment for me to just say, okay, you know what? I go full for the tour. I prepare myself full for the tour. I eliminate any possible risk for crashes before the tour, train a lot, race little, and, you know, have stay all healthy, <laughs> stay healthy, yeah, stay healthy. Anyway. So, it's probably not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You... He's not going. He's going to do the Giro, and he, he now he says, "Okay, maybe maybe I can do the double, right?" Well, do you know why he's going to do the Giro? I think you guys are forgetting an important component here. He doesn't. He's made room in the bank account for uh, the seven figure sum that's going to drop in there. That's uh, true. Just to show up. Yeah, I mean, and I honestly would be enticed by that as well. But yeah, <laughs> to play devil's advocate, Johan, I, I I agree with you. I think he should just do the tour, but. You'd say, ooh, like the tour, Giro tour double is possible now because I, let, let me rephrase the question. Like who in the Peloton can stay with Taddy Pogacar when he's fit in the Tour de France? There, there's one rider in the world and he is currently not well. So the logic would tell us that the chances have increased. I will say Primo's like we go back to that stage one time trial. The guy took a wrong turn, still wins the time trial by seven seconds a short time trial, 12 minutes long. That guy's looking pretty good. The fact that he didn't break anything, if he can recover from this and Tad is doing the Giro, uh, there's like a little crack of light there for mm. Primo's that there wasn't before. Yeah, like well, that. you know, it's, I think, you know, we can't read too much into a 10 kilometer time trial, but definitely what I did see was that Primo's had a wake up call in Paris Nice uh, and he did the work between Paris nice and the Basque country. And he was ready, you know, he was super, super dominant. I mean, winning that 10 kilometer time trial with 15 seconds on the, on the other favorites, <laughs> having taken the wrong turn. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty Rem impressive. Remco, Remco crashed, Remco crashed yeah, in yeah. the second corner. Yeah. Jonas didn't, uh, and, and others didn't either. Um, so yeah, he, it looked like he was, you know, ready to go, but, uh, 
I mean, you know, he won the first time trial, then, uh, you know, stage two and three. What did we say to stage two and three? Was it two times the sprint? Uh, I, I seem to remember. Well, it was a really weird race. Uh, outside of the crash, I feel like the crash was a smoke. I don't know. Without the crash, you'd say this was a weird bass country because you had the time trial and then stages two through five were all sprints. And then stage six was the only GC day. And you think, well, that's kind of a, an odd way to set up a race. But I guess we just let's just call out the stage winners because there were some interesting stage winners here. Like Roglic wins stage one despite falling. Um, you're going to have to help me on the name here, Johan. Paul Lapera. La, La How do you say that? Lapera. Lapera. Really young guy on decathlon, AG2R, wins the sprint on stage two. I think shocked a lot of people. Um, Quentin Hermans, who's been quiet since finishing second at Liege a few years ago. Win stage three on Alpes and Deconic. Keep an eye I little, on that. I have a little, a little, a little thing to say about that. Uh, a special personal thing. Quentin Hermans wins the stage, stage three, and is the first Belgian in 33 years to win a stage at the Tour of the Basque Country. And the last one to win a stage 33 years ago was yours truly. Yeah. I that was a the, crazy stat, I, I by won, the way. I won the, the uphill time trial in the Tour of the Basque Country. But so since then, not, not a single Belgian had won a stage in the Tour of the, in the, in the, uh, sorry, in the, Tour of the Basque Country. Hmm. And then that is wild. Louis Menchie's win stage four, the neutralized one, they let the breakaway contest it. Um, yeah. you know, I, he, he even said after the stage, like, this doesn't feel like a real win. But I put that in your back. Put that in the back of your mind for these Grand Tours when he's trying to pick stage winners, uh, stage 15 of a Grand Tour. Louis looked good this year. Roman Gregoire wins stage five. He's 21 years old on Groupama FDG. Um, and like, yeah, like Ethan Hader, Ineos brought Ethan Hader here to win sprints and tried to set him up. So like this wasn't, it's like this wasn't, no, no one's contesting it. Like that was an impressive win, I thought. Um, and then stage six today. One by Carlos Rodriguez. I thought that's the best he's looked all year. The first time I've seen him all year, where I thought ah, he could he could replicate that performance from the tour last year when he finished fifth. Big story though, Juan Ayuso wins the overall because he gets second behind Rodriguez. Probably struck a deal there to work together. But UAE, who I've said kind of looks like uh, the Three Stooges at times when Tadej Pogacar is not there tactically, they were perfect today. And, and you know, similar to last week at Flanders, they where they had what four riders in the top twenty or whatever. They have three riders in the top 10 today, and they just played it perfectly. They had guys up in the break. They send Soler up there, who was 40. I think he was like 41 seconds off the GC. So he's in the breakaway in the virtual lead, putting pressure on Little Trek and Mateusz Skelmoza behind. And then Juan Iuso attacks out of there after Skelmoza uses all of his domestiques. I mean, it's textbook stuff. Skelmoza eventually bridges up with Rodriguez on the descent, which was impressive. But then Ayuso says, oh, on the last climb, I'll just attack again. Gets away with Rodriguez. Schelmoza can't follow. The race looked really, it was just like one of these classic Basque stages where it was just up and down all day. Everyone looked very salty too. It might've been a little warm. And then those guys rode away. Rodriguez gets the stage win. Ayuso wins the overall. And I guess we'll never know. I was kind of left with the question though, of like, does Ayuso win this anyway? Like, would he have won this even with all those big names here? Like he looked really incredible today. Listen, he's the real deal. Uh, he's, you know, let's not forget this was a teenager who finished podium in the Vuelta two years ago. Uh, finished fourth, I think, fourth last year in the Vuelta. Um, no, actually, Carlos Rodriguez and Juan Ayuso were two of our picks two years ago on our up and comers show. We said Carlos Rodriguez and Juan Ayuso, the two real big talents. I mean, they, they were, they were, they were, you know, dominating the tour of the Basque country today. Um, I, I think Ayuso is, is a big champion. He has the champion's mentality, um, you know, races to win always. Um, I'm interested to see what kind of role he's going to play in because he does the tour de France this year. And this is a guy, let me tell you, obviously he will get the instructions of the team and, but this guy does not have in his DNA to be a domestique. There's not a single hair on his head that thinks that he should be working for someone else. This guy wants to win. Um, obviously, Pogacar is better right now, um, but that's going to be interesting to see a guy like that on Pogacar's team. Uh, well, 
And especially, now I hadn't thought about this before, especially since Pogaccio is doing the Giro. Ayuso is doing a clean run to the Tour. Maybe this is getting ahead of myself. Obviously, Pogaccio is the better rider. But, I mean, what if Pogaccio is fatigued at the Tour? Like, you could, not impossible to imagine a scenario where there's a little bit of, do you remember this year? I think it was 2018 where it was Froome and Thomas on Sky. Froome had done the Giro, was not himself at the Tour. Thomas was better. And there is a little bit of friction there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think for probably for for Ayuso, you know, having ambition to win the tour for the moment, I think it's a bit too high. Not in the not in the future. I think in the future, this guy this guy's going to win a Grand Tour. Uh, but but anyways, listen. I mean, and you're uh, such at such young age, being able to win the Tour of the Basque Country. Okay, you know, the big favorites crashed out, but still. He was I mean, dominant. He was dominating that stage today. Yeah, dismantling a strong little Trek team. Yeah. It was really impressive. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock for for Johan in particular. Just so you know, some context here. He is at with a, 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 a hotel full of guests at uh, Perry Roubaix, mm -hmm. and so you need to go entertain. Everyone's probably twiddling their thumbs. They probably don't even know how to lift up their silverware and have dinner without uh, Johan there to guide do. them. They do. <laughs> So Johan's the he's the director at these camps, by the way. So nothing just moves had a, an amazing experience. They rode the 145 kilometer uh, section of Paris Roubaix uh, Grand Fondo today with uh, with George Hincapie and Johan Museu as their guides. So they're yeah they're tired, but they're very happy. So I'm gonna I mean, and, and I think they're hungry. So I have to run. Okay, real quick too before I let both of you go. Some sort of hint uh, about Perry Roubaix. Have you already, you've already done your outcome show, correct? We did. Yeah. yeah. Give us a little. I mean, everyone knows Vanderpool's the man to watch. Give us something else to watch for. We, I mean, we've got Peterson, Stefan Kung, Betiel. Who else is is looking good right now? Yeah, you know, I'm the guys. Well, I here is I. I'm biased. I'm heavily biased because I know him personally. And I've ridden with them a lot, raced against them. Riley Sheehan, plus 12,000 to win. 12,500, 13th at Flanders. Roubaix is actually better for him. That's that's one to just keep an eye on right there. No. no. Ah, yo, Johan doesn't, <laughs> doesn't respect these American riders. Another, I mean, listen, he's strong. He's strong, but he's not going to win Paris Roubaix. Let me tell you that much. Another crazy pick Johan <laughs> yeah, had. Not yet, at least. Is, yeah, give, give us uh, another Stephon, one. Stefan Kuhn for the podium. Uh, yeah. I found an even better price after we did the show, Johan. Um, <laughs> it's I almost thought something was wrong with the the bookies, but that 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 was a really good one. I thought. Yeah. Okay. You well, you can get that before whoever, the show. Whoever whoever beats Mathieu van der Poel. I mean, uh, the difference with Flanders is that Paris Roubaix. The, uh, there's an added factor of luck and bad luck. Or not having any bad luck, uh, so we 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 can't control it. But today, for example, we had one of our guests. You know, I mean, he is, he had perfect equipment. He punctured three times. I mean, there's not much you can do. You know, how were the cobbles? They're wet, not good. Muddy. They're, they're muddy. Good. Yeah, they're muddy, and they're, they're like Arnberg Forest is. It's wow. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. And those of you interested in the women's race, Lance, uh, Ali and Mari have covered that. You can catch that where you get your podcast feed or on YouTube uh, as well. Yo, I'm going to let you get back to work. I know you've got a lot ahead of you in the next day or two. Uh, of course, not just entertaining the guests covering all these races, including Perry Roubaix. We'll all be back for that as well. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, JB. Have a good night, Johan. Goodbye. Yeah,